Evan is doing a heroic job. He wouldn't tell you himself, but he feels terrible and is completely congested and blocked up and can hardly move. So thank you for being here, Devon, and heroic on the song. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, brothers and sisters, our New Testament reading today is from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus from the third chapter, and we'll read verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, and from whom every family in heaven and on, on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Okay, so we've been talking about Paul and uh, Paul's understanding of prayer over the last uh, few weeks. And this is the second uh, uh, prayer from his letter to the church at Ephesus that we've looked at. And I would like to try and work my way into this. Last week, we talked about how through prayer, the, the Spirit of God comes and works within us. The way that's often described as the Spirit witnesses with our spirit. It's through that that we are uh, made aware of and, and empowered to use our spiritual gifts for the good of everyone. You remember, that's how that works. And, and I said last week that when that comes together properly, what happens is uh, that the world's deepest needs and your deepest passion come together with each other. And that's how you change the world, just like, just like that. And then on the way out, um, Josh, who comes to the first service here, said, so what is the world's deepest need? I want to talk about that because Paul addresses that in this prayer. So that's where we're going to go. What we know about prayer so far from Paul is it looks like this. You pray, it involves intentional waiting. So not just sitting and dozing off or with your mind wandering, but intentionally focused waiting. Uh, the Spirit of God intercedes, witnesses with your spirit. God the Father knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Transformation occurs within us. We become increasingly conformed to the image of Christ. And then we act and respond to the, whatever it is we're praying about in more and more Christ-like ways. Our response becomes increasingly Christ-like. And that's how you live a life aligned with the will of God or that's oriented towards the kingdom or however you want to say that. That's sort of how it works. So Paul says it like this. Step one, intentional waiting. You hold the prayer in your thoughts. Try not to let your mind wander. Maybe talk to somebody about it because that helps you keep focused on the subject and you don't drift off and start thinking, what am I going to have for lunch or things like that. So, so what you're doing while you're doing that is you're hoping for something that you can't see and you're waiting for it patiently but in a focused way. And then the Spirit acts. The Spirit of God acts, witnesses with your spirit. That very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words which is another way of saying that's a little bit mysterious, which it is. Let's be honest about that. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. So God knows what the situation is. And the work of the Spirit with your Spirit, as it empowers you, transforms you, and in this highly technical piece from Romans, you become increasingly conformed to the image of the sun. So you respond in more Christ-like ways. Now you know what to do. Now you know how to respond to whatever it is you're praying about. It's you that's changed. So you respond in more and more Christ-like ways. And you're empowered through the work of the Holy Spirit with your spirit to use your spiritual gifts for the common good. 
remember, it's not used for the common good, then it's not a spiritual gift. Then spirit giftedness from God is never used for your own personal benefit. It's always a communal thing. So all of that is going on. Now, in this little prayer that we just read from Paul's letter, you will notice, even though Paul is writing something almost 300 years before the doctrine of the Trinity has been thought up and written down, it took 300 years you can see this in his prayer. I bow my knees before the Father, that you may be strengthened in your inner being through the power that, of the Spirit, and then Christ may dwell in your hearts. In other words, you become more Christ-like. So you have a Father, Son, Spirit movement in his prayers. Even though he's hundreds of years before the doctrine of the Trinity, he could still see it in the way that he understood uh, how prayer works. So there's this sort of proto-Trinitarian movement going on there. And the petition in Paul's prayer that I just read to you is about being rooted and grounded in love. It's very important that the transformation that occurs with us is all about love. It's all about being rooted in it. You know, and the more firmly rooted you are in the ground, the less likely you are to blow over when the storms come, right? You get rooted and grounded. That's really good. <clears throat> and then the passage talks about mm, answering questions about what's the breadth and length and height and depth and knowing God. And, and, and it's a strange construction. If you look at that, Paul is praying for you to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And you think, wait a minute, that sentence is kind of a, it's a loop on itself, right? And it's self-contradictory. But I think what he means is... He wants you to know the love of Christ. That's something that we would say happens here. Even though it surpasses knowledge, which happens here. I think that's what he means. There's a difference there, right? A bit hard to put into words, but I think that's his idea because it's about transformation that he's talking about. This passage about breadth and length and height and depth and love has uh, had people reading it and thinking about it for centuries and centuries and centuries. And uh, I think it probably, Paul, probably, Paul is thinking about a very ancient writings from the book of Job. You know, in the Old Testament, which Paul was very familiar with, Job is very, very, very old. It may be like one of the very oldest writings in the Hebrew Bible. And in Job, it talks about the breadth and length and height and depth. It says, as you can see, can you find out the deep things of God? It's a question. And then it goes through and says, what are the limits? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Well, wherever it is, he says, it's higher than heaven. It's deeper than Sheol. Sheol is the place where dead people go. Uh, its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the, than the sea. So it similarly talks about breadth and length and height and depth. And I think uh, Paul knew this because he knew all of those scriptures and was thinking about that. And what he's really thinking about here is this question about the dimensions and the expanse of the love of God that to him was made known through Christ Jesus. Like, what's the limit of the love of God? What is its breadth and length and so on? Does it have limits? How does that work? Well, John Wesley was uh, very interested in this passage, and he wrote this way in his commentary on the Bible. Uh, what's the breadth of the love of God? He said, embracing all mankind... Now, today, of course, if he was writing, he would say all humankind, wouldn't he? But you have to give him a break. He was writing in the 1700s, and people didn't do that then. So, so this is in the 1700s. This is a mainstream Christian. And when asked what's the breadth of the love of Christ, he says it embraces everyone. Not just some people. Everyone. And... Um, is that a new thing? Does it, has it been going on for a while? Will it last? He says it's from everlasting to everlasting. It's not a new idea. He says it's always been that way. Read the whole story. It's always been that way, and it always will be that way, that the breadth and the love of Christ, or you might say the breadth and the love of God made known through Christ, embraces everyone, and it's always been like that. And it's so profound, so deep, that you can't even kind of think it through. 
And I think that's probably true, because if you're like me, you know some people who are really difficult to love, right? <laughs> you, we all know some folks like that, really hard. And it's almost unfathomable how to do it. Um, but Paul says, yeah, that can be done because the, the God's love is, is so reaches to such a height that no enemy, in other words, hatred and things like that, can get across it. It's, it's too, too big, too big. This idea of Wesley's, you know, some people have said to me, well, that idea that the love of Christ embraces everybody all over the world, you know, he just made that up. That's a, mm, mm, mm. no, he didn't, no, he didn't. All the way back to the very earliest writings of the church fathers, you'll find somebody like John Chrysostom, in his seventh homily on Ephesians, right, that the breadth and length and height and depth, that is the immensity of the love of God, it extends everywhere. Christians have always believed this. Somehow we forgot along the way and said it only goes this far, and if you're on the other side, you're basically done, right? No Christians ever believed this. John Chrysostom, by the way, is not his last name. It's from the Greek that means golden-mouthed because he was such a brilliant preacher. Everybody said he had a golden mouth. Everything that came out of his mouth was like gold. And this came out of his mouth, that the immensity of the love of God extends everywhere. That's gold. Um, so let's just do a quick example of this. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the immensity of the love of God and how it extends everywhere. Let's imagine that we're just sitting here like this. Imagine it's at some event and I'm not here and Diana's not here, but you're all here. And the door's open and somebody comes in through the door and they have a little baby like this in a basket. And they rush in and they put the baby down here. And then, like that, they rush out the door, jump in the car and go. And the baby's just left there. And you get to the end of your hour together. What are you going to do? You're just going to go home and leave the baby there? I don't think so. I, I, I know most of you a little bit and some of you very well. I know there's a single person in here who would just go and leave the baby there, right? Nobody would do that. Nobody. Suppose the person left the baby just in between the two sets of doors. Would you leave the baby and just go? No, of course you wouldn't. Suppose a person left the baby just over the other side of the parking lot by the fence. Did you leave the baby there? No? I suppose somebody left the baby out just on the other side of Hill Avenue. Would you leave the baby there and just go home? How about the other side of the block? Or at the edge of the city limit of Toledo? or at the border between Ohio and Michigan, or across the other side of the country, or across the other side of the world. I just want to know where the limits of your love lie, because if it was me with that basket with the baby in it, I wouldn't want to put it down one foot, the wrong side of the line, that your love peters out right here, and I put the baby one foot there. See, because then that would be tragic, wouldn't it? Because, see, the thing is, the baby is real. The baby, I'm not making this up. I just don't have the baby right here. The baby is real and out there. And we're told that the love of God extends everywhere and includes everyone and goes all the way to all of the, of the whole of the created order, including that child who is real. So when Paul writes about the love of God, as far as he's concerned, the love of God has no limits. His most famous passage, which is also from Romans 8, which is the place that we've been mining Romans 8 to find out about prayers and things like this. He writes this very famous passage. He says he is convinced, convinced, not even death can take you away from it. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, and then he works in his height and depth thing that we just talked about. Height and depth, not anything else, nothing in the whole created order, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, period. 
So the love of God has no limits, right? But that's not really the question, is it? The question is, as we are transformed to live in the world in the image of God, what about our love? Because we're the hands and feet. And if the, the love of God embraces everybody, but ours peters out at the edge of Hill Avenue there, we've got a real problem, haven't we? So um, let's just think about this for a minute. And I realize that actually my question about the baby is a little bit of a trick, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But here's the thing. We talked last week about the idea that everybody has gifts that come from God. They're not skills or things you've learned. And those gifts are the grace of God working in us, empowering us to match our deep passions with the world's deep need. That's how you become an expression of the immensity of the love of God and how it extends everywhere. That's what we looked at. And then the question is, so what is the world's deepest need? And Paul, it, this is, in all honesty, almost the only thing that Paul writes about, only he does it so many different ways that it gets confusing for people. All of his, his writings, one way or another, have got something to do with this, that Paul's prayer is for the transformation of us through the love of God to take us from a position that looks like this, where we say, there's us, and there's them. We are, in some sense, worth more, in some way, than them, whoever they are. And what Paul says is, no, 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 no. You need to pull those two lines down next to each other, us and them. And then if you just blink twice, you'll realize that there is no us and them, it's just us. Because it looks like this, you see? That's what he's, his prayers, his writings, he's forever talking about unity and being together and of one mind and all this sort of stuff. It's all about this, bottom line, it really is. When he writes in Galatians, for example, you all know this passage because you hear it all the time, so many times that it washes over us. There's no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus, right? He says that. And today, we read this, and well, it's just obvious, isn't it, to us? It's obvious that, that we shouldn't divide people up as to, like, their religious preference and say, okay, there's, uh, there's Greeks and there's Jews. Uh, we shouldn't divide people up and say there's males and females. We shouldn't divide people up and say there's slave owners and slaves. We just shouldn't do that. That's just wrong. It's obvious, isn't it? In Paul's day, there was not a single person alive who would have thought that that was obvious. Not one. And the reason for that is that this idea that there's no us and them, it's just us, is an absolute revolution in thinking. I, it is. And it's, we miss it all the time. We just miss it. And here's how you know that it's a revolution. When you read the Bible, if you read through the Old Testament, if you're reading it uh, in its original form, as you know, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, there's a little bit of Aramaic in it, and Hebrew is a Semitic language that you write from right to left on the page. It's in a, an alphabet that has 22 consonants and no vowels. It's not a tensed language. So, and then you turn the page and the New Testament starts. And the New Testament is written in Greek, which is from a different language family. It's written from left to right. It uses different symbols for the letters. It's a tense language. And what happened? What happened in between the last page of the Old Testament and the first page of the New Testament? There's about 300 years of history in there, about. And what happened is Alexander the Great happened. Now, Alexander the Great, who's one of the greatest military minds in all of history, right up to today, uh, he was raised in the Mediterranean basin, and Aristotle was his tutor when he was a teenager. Aristotle. Can you imagine having Aristotle be your tutor? It'd be like, oh. And uh, he, when he took over from his dad, he mounted this campaign and he took the whole of the Mediterranean basin, pushing out all across the known world. He died very young, probably poisoned in Babylon. 
But he had a purpose in doing this, and his purpose was to spread the benefits of Greco-Roman society across the world because he believed in them. He believed in Greco-Roman law and ethics and all of that sort of stuff, and his intention was to spread it everywhere, so off he went. And he learned all of those things from Aristotle. And Aristotle had a certain vision of the world. Included in his vision was to peek into the future, that's called teleology, and recognize that everything exists for a purpose. Now today, most people don't think teleologically, so this idea would never occur to them. I think we've lost a lot here. But one of the things that happened with Aristotle was he looked at people around him and he said, everybody here has a purpose. But you're all different. So different people have different purposes. And then he'd say, well, that person is obviously intended to be a slave because they're a bit dumb and a bit brute-like. They're slaves by nature. And that very elegant, sophisticated, rich person is obviously meant to be a master. That is his purpose. That's what Ar this is Aristotle's thinking, I promise you, it is. And so he would say the master possesses the commanding power and the intellect and the ability to rule, and the person down here is just fit to carry out menial duties the way that the beasts did. That's the natural order of things, everyone to their own purpose. And every single person in the Mediterranean basin in the Gentile world in Paul's day believed this. Everyone. That's why you will not find anywhere in the New Testament a condemnation of slavery as an institution. You won't find it. Now, Paul would say, there's a master and there's a slave. You are both brothers in Christ you should treat each other respectfully. The, the master should not be flogging and beating the slave, and the slave should not be disobeying the master because you are brothers in Christ. Can you believe that? He didn't say it was wrong to have slavery. Nowhere in the Bible will you find people condemning slavery as an institution. In fact, if you keep reading in early Christian literature, you'll have to get to the year 379, and in the year 379, one of the early church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, preached a sermon. It was the fourth one in a series on Ecclesiastes, and it's the first time in Christian history that slavery is condemned as an institution. It took 379 years to, to get there. Can you believe that? So, what does that mean? Well, when uh, Paul says this, he doesn't really understand how to do it in the world. That there's, that there's people are equal to each other. He hadn't yet recognized that Aristotle's idea of purpose is a good one, but everyone has the same purpose because the love of God is spreads to cover everyone, right? Everyone has the same purpose, and the purpose is to fully recover the image of God in our lives as individuals and community and then live that out. So, it's not often that I will stand up and say Aristotle is wrong, because Aristotle is brilliant, but Aristotle was wrong. He was wrong in that his, he was limited by his own vision of the world. You know, he only knew about that little bit of the world. So, this idea here of Paul's that we can, we can take people that are us and them and make them all into us is, is a revolutionary idea and it's so important because when we do that the solution to this problem becomes obvious. See, if we all saw ourselves not as us and them but as us then wherever this child is there will be a group of people like this who see him and say he's one of us and they'll go and bring him in. And we'll be here, and we'll see some child or something who's hung. We'll go and bring them in, and they will be one of us. And so, you see, my idea about moving the child slowly across the world is a little bit of a trick, because the solution to it is not that you are personally responsible for every single child in the world, because that'll kill you. But if everybody in the world can shift their thinking from us and them to there's just us, here's the planet, there's us, 
The love of God expands everywhere. And this child is real. And so we can reach out with the love of God, become increasingly conformed to the image of Christ, and help each child that we encounter. And when we do that, the world will be changed and the kingdom will become real. On your way home, just remember the four words. The child is real. <laughs>